everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is our last biology, ecology, and evolution seminar of the year. Ironically, our first seminar about um, this is all that means that the graduate student body voted with the um, afterwards. If you feel like joining us, go ahead and stick around and I'll clear to meet us there. Um, Dr. Olivia Cheryl, who is Native Bee Scientist and teacher at Santa Fe Girls School in New Mexico. She earned her PhD in plant biology from Southern Illinois University of Carbondale. Her research area entails bees, pollination, chemical ecology, biography, and insect conservation. She has two published books on North America's native bees, the bees in your backyard, and common bees of Eastern North America. And her seminar today is devoted to quantifying pollinators across large landscapes. Thank you very much. Um, I, can you online hear me? Does this sound all right? Okay. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've had a great day meeting a lot of graduate students and professors doing really interesting work and in research systems and everything. It's been, it's been pretty awesome. Um, Alex, thank you so much, and Elsa for helping to arrange my travel out here. Super smooth, and I really appreciate that. Um, I, am, uh, I have many talks. You heard about a couple of them. Uh, but the thing that matters today is that uh, I'm an independent consultant, and I work on a lot of large landscapes throughout Western North America. So I'm going to kind of focus on that a little bit today. How many of you here are graduate students? How many do we have that are graduate students? Okay, how many for it's just like kind of split a little bit. Um, one of the things that I really want to communicate to come out here um, is number one that there are a lot of different career paths that you can take that can um, be very exciting. And two, um, data that you're collecting now or maybe collected in the back lab somewhere, all of it will come in handy at some point. Um, if you're a professor and you think that might be true, raise your hand so we can find it. It all comes in handy. All the data is useful. We will refer back to it. Wild bees. So before I start here, I want to tell you some of the things that I'm working on. This is sort of my to-do list when I go home. Um, I have several projects that I'm currently working on right now. One is I'm documenting wild bee pollinators that are found on 10 rare plants that are endemic to the state of New Mexico. I'm trying to figure out uh, not only who the pollinators are on these plants and whether they need pollinators, but then also looking at what the pollinator habitat may entail so that when they go to protect these, these rare plants, they can do that in their management. I just started a project studying these on the Tonto National Forest. Which Phoenix, Arizona, and moved from pretty low, what are we? So, way up in the mountains, there's an elevation of gradient of bees in different environments, and it's an area that a fair number of burns, so you burned and unburned areas, and kind of compare and contrast them in different um, And I found that the ELM to design a bee monitoring protocol for studying bees across western landscapes. That's kind of a big one. If you're not familiar with what the BLM yet is, I promise I'll explain that term in just a little bit. Um, what I want you to do is that one slide. I think you can tell that to be or not to be is a question. This is a question that I'm going to ask today, and I'm hopeful that you will help me to answer it. I don't have all the answers, but I'll make sure that's really clear for me because I'm working on and I'm I'm looking for input and feedback. So uh, I welcome any any thoughts you might have. I'll tell you what I see as changes and I'll also the opportunity. Before I do, I need to make sure we all know what we're talking about today. Quite often when I say the word bees, the thing that comes to mind is what is it? What comes to mind? Honey bee, obviously. Yeah, maybe honey bees a lot of bees. You know, first when they hear that word. And so I want to make it clear that I don't study honey bees. Maybe a little bit that they interact with each other bees, but most of the study we can think of is wild bees. So wild bees are primarily solitary, so they eat 
Raphael builds her own nest. Um, then she goes out and gathers the pollen and nectar that she needs. Those nests are often in the ground. Many of them, where I am, most of them are ground nesting. The ones that aren't in the ground are in twigs or pieces of wood or snail shells or all sorts of different things. Not in a hive, not in a colony, no honey, none of those. So she builds this nest in the ground, and then she gathers pollen and nectar and brings those things back to the nest, and she gives those things, leaves those things behind for her offspring to eat uh, later. So if she's gathering all this pollen, not like this, like this for her offspring, many of them are expected in the desert to eat one of the colliders. Meaning they eat them and raise a wide array of plants, but when they can gather pollen and nectar, they limit themselves to plants. Maybe it's everything in the same plant genus, maybe it's the whole plant. They, they limit what it is that they can eat. All right, and there's a lot of these. Uh, uh, I think worldwide, there's somewhere between 20 and 30,000 different species. In North America, somewhere between 1,500 different species. In do you have a number? What are we at here? Five species. That's really good. That's great. Yeah. Um, I had a much lower count, so that's going to be cool. I'm gonna... um, and so before I dive into sort of this giant and overwhelming topic of, of finding bees on humongous landscapes, I want to give you a little background on how I came to be here of all places today talking to you about bees. And the story starts. A long time ago, back when I was 19, and I conducted a survey. Look at that. It's changed. My technique has improved too, I might add. Um, I did a, an, an inventory. So I made a list of the bees of a national monument in California called the Pinnacles National Monument. And so here's the whole country. It's a place right over here. At the time, for study it was about 25 square miles so five by five little box it's not very big at all. Um, I, because I had this burning passion about bees I barely had been introduced to them at that point the first bee I caught I was so excited and I remember taking it to my mentor so I'm and he told me it's a honeybee and it was very disappointing day um I went because uh, I wanted to camp I wanted to hike I wanted to be outside and I wanted to see my plants all Fun job. Curiously uh, enough, things are pretty fun. Um, and it didn't hurt that California bees sometimes from early February through June, which was the same as the semester during which I was supposed to take organic chemistry. So, um, for me, the word was kind of an early window into why ecology is so cool. I could see the between years across different habitats, across elevation. And it was easier to grasp it by seeing it play out in the field than it was in the textbook. You know, they have those beautiful lines in all of the textbooks, but to see this tangible manifestation of these interactions between bees and their plants was, was pretty cool. I was completely hooked on bees as the medium of this whole ecological process. Great. What's really amazing is that now, uh, 20 some odd years later, there are two graduate students that have come behind me and returned to the calls and resampled for bees in these regions and watched to see how the bees have changed over the last 20 years. So that, that feels pretty cool. Um, even as a beginner, though, I could see how they collected bees or how often I collected bees or whether I used a net versus traps or something else, um, whether I collect a lot of transept or in a plot might really impact what sort of data I got, what conclusions I draw. So when I was in Pinnacles, I collected a series of transepts. Really, they were just the trails in the park. So every three weeks, I would revisit each little section of trail and resample along. And I recorded the location, I recorded the flower, um, I recorded but beyond recording, if it was like in the morning or in the afternoon, I didn't really record how long I spent on these different segments or how long I spent on each flower. And you can imagine this is getting that difficult for the graduate students that have tried to come back and resell areas because they don't know how much time I spent doing each of these things. A little bit. 
Uh, so with a little more thought and a few more classes, including that organic chemistry class under my belt, uh, I tried to again. It's time for my master's project uh, at Utah State University, conducting a, a survey of the bees of Grand Staircase and Kalani National Monument. So uh, you probably could tell there, it's in sort of south central Utah. It's a pretty big area. Um, funny, it's huge. The area is huge. Yeah, there's about 2 million acres, 1.8 Plenty of space for me to either walk or swim. Um, for this study, I wanted to combine the idea of monitoring in addition to inventory. So in addition to that laundry list of bees, I wanted to do something more. And we'll talk about what exactly that is here. Um, so I structured this a little differently. I had a lot of field technicians to help. And I, I made it so that we had these plots, these little squares Yellow, yellow squares, and those plots were sampled in the same way in a very standardized way on a regular. But then I also allowed my field techs to collect opportunistic wherever they wanted, walking to a spot they could stop and collect it. And it's given me a really nice view of them. Here are these different things. At the time that I did this grand staircase was a brand new national monument by President Clinton in 1996, um, and it had a focus on science. I think mostly they were geared towards seeing fossil beds that are there. There's all these dinosaurs that they keep finding. Dinosaur bones that they keep finding. Um, but then also birds, herbs, and insects, and of course that includes the pollinators. So I wanted to give them sort of science-y information, something they could use to tell them which habitats had the most bees, plants were the best. Um, and so we did the following. We set up one hectare plots. So that's pretty much meters by 100 meters inside. And I did it either as a long rectangle if the habitat required that in order to avoid sort of ecotones um, or a square. And then each of these areas, when it was collected, was collected for 45 minutes. We time ourselves for 45 minutes. We collected it twice on a given day. And each time it was collected, there were two in there. So two people would collect this plot in the morning, the same two people would collect that plot in the afternoon. Um, I had a total of 48 plots that we sampled in this way, and we every two weeks across the duration of the flower season, pretty much April through August. Uh, what's really we're funding to do it for four consecutive years. So we have this six month data set across four years, and this gave me standardized, quantifiable data that I could compare a plot here to a plot over there. I could compare this plot to itself over time, compare between years. I could do all these really interesting comparisons and feel fairly confident that what I was finding was a result of actual things happening on the landscape, not my collecting, throwing things off. But what's more, uh, this also allows for really nice plant pollinator Oh, how many bee plants are relative uh, in that time period? It worked really well. I can definitely see changes in the plots over the season and also between years. I still get a pretty good inventory of the bees there. And this area is now, we can go back 20 years later and look at places over a longer period of time, which is great. Uh, the downside is that it was a gigantic effort, so much time and effort. Uh, in order to pull this off. I had six to eight technicians working full time for the duration of the flowering season. And then after we had all of our bee data, we had you know, 8,000 individuals that had to be pinned and labeled and identified and entered into a database. And that whole effort took five years. So you were talking about a mass who's taking three, mine took six. <laughs> so uh, now we're going to I finished that. I went and I got a PhD. Um, I did a whole bunch of other bee work um, and I wrote a bee book. This is our coming out here very, very soon. It's going to be fun. Um, and of course, I can't skip over this thing that happened in my life, which is my two daughters. They were born during that time period and um, they were there. It's hard to be out there. with mom. That was kind of late. But, um, Grow a little less reluctant. They actually really enjoy it. They head out with me all the time. And last summer when it got really hot, I was having trouble keeping them motivated. I told them I'd pay them five dollars for every bee they caught, thinking it would cost me ten bucks. You know, 
uh, $75 later, I had to cut it off. I'll need to adjust my baby for the hour that I need to. Kind of ridiculous. Um, I have these great field hands that help me now. And during those years, that all of those things were happening, books were being written and doing a couple little projects, starting a family. Um, while my girls were, were getting their go, uh, a lot of research about bees and monitoring bees and how best to do these things came out. Because we all realized this thing that some of the stuff humans were doing on landscapes was definitely not good for the history. Nesting habitat, even if we don't have the data to back it up, it seems likely that that's the case. So we can extrapolate based on our understanding, but the downside is that we didn't have quantifiable data. How many are all bees declining in the way? Do the different ones experience, you know, whatever stressors are out there in different ways? And how much are these bees really changing? Um, so many papers have come out about this. I'm going to give you a synopsis of kind of what we're going to do. I'm going to preface it by saying not much. But here's just a quick synopsis. This study is from uh, 2012. Um, and it looked at just the presence or absence of bees in eastern states before and after the year 1970 based on digitized records in all these museum collections uh, across North America. It found that she's documented before 1970 it was still there so presence absence wise there is a change but and this is one way to give us a sense of what's going on um but this doesn't tell us if any of them are on decline but haven't yet right we're missing a bit of information uh, other studies have shown that a handful of bumblebees in decline too dramatically in the eastern u.s two in the west at the same time, we're finding that there's a couple of bee species or bumblebee species, especially that are more common. So, not even within the genus Bombus are all species responding to the environment in which they occur in the same way. It's kind of interesting. Uh, this amazing study looked at plant pollinator relationships, documented 120 ish years ago, um, and compared them to the plant pollinator relationships now on the same 26 plants. They looked at 26 plants that had been really well studied a century ago and looked at the same plants now to see what bees were on them and if they were the same bees. They found that um, many of the species that had been collected 100 years ago were no longer on those plants, but there were some species on them now. So there was sort of a turnover, a change in what species were on there. Um, and whether the species that aren't on there have switched on to really active basic non-native plants, we don't know. We don't know if they're gone or just on a different plant. But the pollinator networks for sure have changed in this area in Illinois. Um, some studies have shown that while some bees are becoming the less common, uh, non-native species are becoming and there seems to be this general trend where rare species are becoming rarer, while common species are becoming more abundant. Caveat here, what we don't know is if this is because the techniques that we use to collect bees may favor some of those more common bees and elevate them in this. So in some, among bees at least, it appears that there's, there's some bees that are winning, some bees that are doing fine. Uh, the common thread across most of these studies that I've read suggests that habitat modification and pesticide use and climate change in invasive plants are probably significantly, probably negatively affecting one or more species. But most of this data focuses on one taxonomy, often bombus, um, or one region, often Europe because they have older or complete sets, sometimes states, very seldom Western Europe. And this lack of standardized data has kind of hindered our ability to make on sort of make either a broad generalization about something or something very, very specific. That can't run out in the same because we don't have the data to do that. So it's against this backdrop that I was funded by the BLM to create a survey method for uh, sampling bees across public lands. Uh, BLM lands are kind of a big deal in the Southwest. They wanted something that was standardized 
I think they should do something that doesn't require a ton of training because becoming a bee expert has taken a long time, and I know they don't have that long. Um, and then we're going to allow the BLM to both monitor bees over the long term, but also help them create those laundry lists that they so love to have so they can be proud of the area that they work in. There's something about saying, I have this many bees that makes people feel good. Um, right? North Carolina is cool. Yeah. yeah. I've had some experience over the years collecting bees in large landscapes. I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing because the more I know about this, the more I realize I don't know. Um, but anyway, that's where we're at. Uh, the BLM is Bureau of Land Management. It's a large federal agency. They manage about 245 million acres in mostly the western U.S. all the way to Alaska. Um, and what's really cool is that this is an area where oftentimes before a change to the landscape occurs, there's a lot of planning, which means if we're involved with the hearing as a part of this, they can say, here's why we know solar panels are going in this place. Collect before data, we can collect after data, and there are pristine natural areas that don't get altered at all that we can compare to. So it's for a really nice data set. If we can pull this on, uh, that would be cool. What's more, the diversity of bees that occur in the regions that are BLM land is incredible. Uh, lots and lots of genera, even more species. I love that the species are the greatest in the whole desert, the Great Basin in Colorado, Manitoba, the desert. But it overlaps well with lands managed by the BLM. So, my goal for the BLM after I take this. My goal for the BLM is to scale so that easier, less time and time uh, intensive uh, things can be done over at charter. If you have a lot of time and ability to devote yourself to this, you can pick and choose your funding and how you Because these units are flexible, they can be compared across space, right? So option A could be compared everywhere because it occurs in all the Um or Oregon to New Mexico, any of those. I have really enjoyed the time I've spent sort of this puzzle of how to do this well. And I want to share with you a little bit about some of the field trials that I've done just to try and get a sense of what's going to work and what's not, and some of the things I'm still doing. But, and it, I did say before, right, we don't have all the answers. So keep them coming. I want to hear from you. Um, so here's some of my problems that I'm up against. When you think about sampling and surveying for bees, it's important to remember that it's really similar to sampling and flowering plants in that flowering plants tend to be patchy. What you have here is not what you have over here. Patches of things everywhere. They tend to be short lived. So what we're seeing in April is different from what's in July or even September. And they tend to change quickly between the All true for bees, with the addition that also they move. In and out, rounded about. So even one day versus the next might be a different community. That kind of thing. The two things that are mostly involved in active netting, um, which for you here, uh, is the thing about using a net is that you can record not only the location and the bees that stuff, but you can also record uh, the plant that the bee is moving, which is really useful information. There's also passive methods. Like a uh, hand touch, usually spray painted fluorescent blue or yellow or maybe white. And you fill them with spray water and leave them out for anywhere from four to 24 hours, depending on where you are and what you're doing. And when you come back, the little holes have collected lots of bees and you filter them and take them back. And then up and you have samples. What's nice is you don't have to stamp it. Um, what's not nice is sometimes you can hold the sample and there are certain groups that don't have to pan traps, so you miss that, that bit of information. Again, there's some different things. The specimens are then taken and labeled and added to a database and then identified. And um, I should point out something about BID. And this is from one of my B heroes, a guy named Theodore Drew Allison Cockrell, who lived a long time ago. Uh, but he actually lived in New Mexico, which is kind of cool. Like, so long ago, he was studying B, like, probably on a horse stuff. Then in one of the publications, there's no doubt that bees from the other species that he's collected in the research 
contribution of many support excellent material for defining zoological regions. But they are not only used for such purposes, but can explain why the inadequacy of existing collections of records, and especially the difficulties of the community in keeping them. And I say nothing for the stay in a really long time. So the VIB part is a definite hurdle that I have to overcome. Them. So I have two small challenges and then a couple of big ones that I have to overcome here. And I want to mention this before I dive into some of these things. Um, always in the back of my mind is this discovery principle. It may be overstamping. It could be impacting everyone. We are the deployed thing that's happening in this landscape. So just be aware of that. That being said, I haven't seen any evidence of this in where I've worked for many years, that these don't seem to consistently all decline after collection. Talking with other people, because I talked with Becky Irwin this morning, and she she kind of has seen the same thing. Um, yeah, and then there's a lot of things out there that we are almost understanding maybe is a form of improvement on this one. The size of the room, how many there are, and the scale of the landscape that we're looking at. Um, so, I don't know, it's something that needs to have in our minds, though there are certain collections weeks that could potentially be resampled. Another challenge that needs to be especially if I'm looking at monitoring the data that gets collected with some of these kinds of things, um, associated with understanding our easy game is collecting all of that peripheral data that it goes around, right? The habitat it's in and all of these things. Um, this doesn't always go with inventory, for instance. What's here? That's it. There's not often a lot of other stuff. Um, monitoring is best, but it includes habitat assessment, and rural community movements. But that monitoring requires more time and effort. You have to take the time to collect that data as well as. All right. On to some of the other things that we're talking about here. Um, third is the challenge of balancing inventory and monitoring. Um, I've heard a fair amount of discussion from the people who are funding me. Especially because um, when you look at maps like this, this is from a pretty recent paper, and it's showing where previously compared to the Atlantic highest for North and South America. And then we compare this with another map from the same location showing collecting efforts for where these early samples. There's a lot of white like in areas that have never been sampled. And if that's the case, maybe we just need to know who's there to leave this idea of counting out. I do want to point out a couple of areas in this area right here. That is the Southwest Range. It's pretty well sampled down in just that little bit there. Um, Southwest Research Station runs a B course. Every fall, August and September, somewhere in there, and all these people from across the U.S. go down there, sample bees, learn how to identify them. Great experience, um, and it leads to a lot of samples, which is cool. So the general idea is land throughout the West, find out which bees live there and in what sort of groups. Those two things, um, these characteristics, richness and abundance, we can think of. Of, as the pillars of inventory and monitoring. This is what both of them are based on. But inventory gives us a snapshot. Think of it as a still photograph of something. Our monitoring is uh, Monitoring obviously relies on solid inventory. I think they actually work well together, but it also relies on consistency sampling method and monitoring requires that you go to that spot even when there's no bees there because with monitoring you have to collect the bees. I'm afraid that might end up being a turnoff to BLM employees who are supposed to head out and then it's pouring and nothing's happening. Collecting zeros can be a little bit. Um, I think we can accomplish both of these together and I'll show you what it's going Data that actually tells us something. So I'll start by going back to some of the data that I've collected from Grand Staircase, the Scalani National Monument, where I had both those monitoring plots that were very standardized, um, and also random collections. What's interesting, about 72 about 72% of all these found in the entire monument were collected inside plots. 
Um, they may have been outside of pots as well. They were also found in the pots collected a fair amount of them. Um, of course, there is a the here in the room, uh, just one isolated region. It's one. We're looking at this area right up to get here. In front of the colonies right here, and we drive down this bumpy road about 50 miles down next to you know uh, road and then these spots in Marshall and the time it rained. And then you find the backpack and you hike up a cliff to the top, and on the top we set up all of those spots. It was a really unique area, different from the rest of the And we did some pretty rigorous collections of the pots up there and some things like how the pots compared to our opportunities to collect that we also did in the area. Um, in total, there were 16 of those one hectare plots set up in this region that was entered in about two years. So overall, 280 found in this area. 221 of those species, so almost 80%, 78% were caught outside of the box, and 243 species, 86%, were collected in the box. So looking through the data, it looks like part of the reason that most of these were caught in the box, and they were more consistent, um, consistent with what is across the species, is that the chance of catching something on an interesting plant in the fall or in early spring would be greater than plots because we were stuck there and had to stare at the ground. So it actually helped, actually helped to be stuck in one place to get some of those things that were on the edges. Um, also, the 33 species that were caught outside of the plots um, uh, were collected in really small uh, were collected in like very few individuals, like one or two individuals were those. So one of them really bad. But 16 is a lot of plots for this little area. So here's how those plots accumulate species. The plots accumulate fewer of these, so we've gotten good data. Um, each one appears to contribute to the species. There's a little evidence of leveling off. Now, the most opportunistic plants that our species So, inventory in the form of this opportunistic collection, um, when you find a plant that looks good, maybe a nice. Of course, this requires. Um, two um, is this tiny little square on this giant landscape. The question then becomes how many plots do you have? Or how many parts should they be? Across a whole big space to really answer the question, especially considering the time and effort it takes to walk between multiple plots and to set them up and to have people. But again, it says in this you might need to set up a plot to really get a sense of everything. I took all of those plots and I compared the, um, the number of species in abundance to all of the other plots. And I did a little break here to similarity, so I had abundance there and looked to see. Zero means that they had nothing. Sorry, one means that they had some, and zero means they had all of the species. And you can see if you look at this by about not finding a lot of similarity. There's a lot of similarity across the land. Towards being, and then a lot of things that don't occur in very high numbers, maybe don't occur in one particular collection of entry months, pop in and out and come and go. Um, and those are the ones that make them dissimilar. All of those together make a plot not very similar uh, to each other. So, this is important to think about because the question is whether we're monitoring, if we notice these changes, are we monitoring something really common of them? Probably are widespread throughout the monument. Or are we sampling for the rare ones that may be more likely to experience a 
experience whatever's happening. Okay. Uh, how many of you but are represented by one? Just a handful of individuals. How much effort do you spend to finding just these ones? So it kind of feels like you can't ignore those little ones because they make up such a big part of the landscape that's there. But documenting changes in them is going to be tricky because when they disappear, you don't know if they've truly disappeared or just flipped out for a second. It can be tricky. Uh, what's more? Three plots with the most bee individuals. So that's the percent of species represented by one individual. And it did not decrease. Uh, so one plot or two plots together, or even three plots, the percent of species that are represented by less than 10 humans held steady at about 70%. So that's kind of high. So the issue really is that, that we're looking at bees at the wrong scale. To see anything meaningful, we right? On a smaller area. Um, I don't know that one hectare is necessarily the best. It's what I've used in the past, and I keep using it for future data to pass data. Or should we be zooming out to look at more of a big picture? These tend to change. They're variable across time and space. Many of them occur in very many years, and most of them are fairly localized. So that's just what we're doing here. Uh, we may need to be shifting away from counting how many of each. Well, there is counting something else instead. Um, should the unit be a uh, bee plant, right? Should we be looking more at the bee plant interactions? Um, I don't know. I've got some ideas about them. Uh, to keep track of these little, my first thought is that maybe we need occupancy. So, how many areas within some place these bees are occupying? We go out and we sample here, to be there at the bee plant, kind of grid an area. And to see what that might look like, I have to this for grand staircase. The first thing I have a few individuals dropped if I went past that three plus. But I love the three, there were still a lot. And it did a little bit. First even be with the most species had a higher proportion of rare species than is probably true for the landscape as a whole. So kind of uh, they weren't necessarily an accurate representation of the population structure. Second, I looked at the relationship between bee abundance um, and overall occurrence. So this is showing how many bees occurred in each plot, so like what they're Bees in the upper right corner are widespread. They're found in every plant and in the areas in between. Um, they're always abundant when they occur. Bees in the upper left corner are widespread, but they're never super abundant. They occur everywhere, but they're kind of spotty. Um, and then, of course, down in the lower right corner are the bees. That would be highly localized and super abundant, even though there are really many of those in this species. Corner are those where there were few individuals they occurred in a handful of plots. Most bees, there's just a couple of them, and they're just in a couple of places. So these are highly localized, which might make detection rates a little bit low. Um, what's more, documenting all of the places where the bee isn't. So we have to collect all of those to really get a sense of the occupancy. And this can be tricky. There are people right now trying to collect some of the rare bumblebees. That zero it, from historical records is hard because no one records that. We don't record that, but um, this would require a gargantuan effort on the part of whoever is doing this. Today. We could switch from considering focus to looking for changes in community composition, maybe to different functional groups, things like that. Maybe pick the superabundant species and watch how they change over. Um, we'd have to figure out which particular functional groups to look at. Um, we'd have to have some data to do it. But what's interesting is where I collected for four years in Grand Staircase, and I had this data for their abundance in one particular plot, and I also had abundance in one plot for four species. And I picked a twig nester, I picked brown nesters, especially was fall bees, spring bees, etc., to make sure there wasn't center. Which is which you use as a surrogate for all the others as a representative of the bee health, because they all sort of occur differently in those four years. Which one might be a good one? And even looking at one species, it's a very abundant bee that occurs in the West. And I looked at it in four different plots over those four years, and even that one bee trends differently. 
So figuring out how best to prevent a change can be tricky. That we're measuring is something that captures sort of community level changes. Maybe a diversity index or a dominance index or something like that that looks for presence of a few sensitive high quality species and their abundance in relation to a sensitive index at insect. Has anyone done this sort of thing with micro and Yeah, you know Yeah, we look at the species that are and we compare those with Maybe we could do something like that for bees. This still would require a huge effort to collect enough data about each of those species. Or maybe we can dance really well and just hone in on those and build up from there. We prioritize it than trying to do it all at once and really understand. So my plan is I'm still putting out the kinks, but I think the easy option will be Sam. I think with pan traps, so option A will be sampling with pan traps. Um, I'll set out a series of the same way, and no matter if you decide to invest a little bit of time on that, you can compare to everyone else who invested in just doing the work. Um, I think I think the priority there should be first and obviously you get data from a lot of different places, um, far and wide across, the world, but not much time spent with a little more time. Incorporate some targeted collection. I've created a list of plants that are very common throughout all of Western North America at the genus level. Things like Anthus, if you're familiar with Western plants, that's probably here too. Huh? Uh, Cecilia, um, what else I looked at? Um, Strelsia, I've got this list of things. And when they go to visit them, set them for a standard period of time, and then we can get that plant data so we can compare. Records of Strelsia during the five minutes collected on in Mexico. Um, and then finally, the last one would be a plot collection. And really sort of uh, include both of those other measures. The plot collection is pretty much pan traps collection together in one place at one time. And with that data, maybe we can see some um, uh, and whatever we approach, we agree on. The other thing that's happening at the same time is that, that I want to mention is that I've partnered with Oregon State University and so excited about this. And we're going to train up, you guys are going to love this. We're training up not the A team, but the B team. And the B team is going to go out, you call them, you say, Help, I need to monitor these. And the B team is volunteers that will head out and collect the data. And how could you possibly get good volunteers? But actually, Oregon has been doing this for some time. They have an Oregon all driven by volunteers, mostly retired people who wish that in a past life they had picked biology as a career, marketing or whatever. And now that they're retired, they're doing their passions. They're very passionate. Many of them are donating their own time and money to do what they do. Figure out what the Running around with nets, just collecting on everything. Um, so when I was in Oregon, I was up there. One of the things that brought up was these masters of skill are really good bee killers. And so the idea is that they have to do the monitoring part, which we get into in a minute. But perhaps that can help fill in the gaps for this giant effort of getting volunteers who are willing to take the time to go do that um, and are very passionate about it. Not to say close, but actually collect the pieces. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. I want to hear any feedback you have, any questions you might have about this um, process. Uh, my plan for all of the bee specimens that we collect is uh, I will do a lot of 
identification. Um, I, because I'm partnering with Riggins, actually taxonomists there that can help now. And when we made this agreement, we entered in with the uh, public program that Logan, Utah has this giant um, taxonomist and they have agreed to help as well. I also have in mind um, intentional work for Don't have answers for me. Oh, okay. That's a good question. Yeah, that number. Right? I know. Divided by two million acres works out to about one bean per four acres per four years. So it's actually a really small sample on a land size. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Okay. No, you're right. The time, yeah, uh, we have to invest. We need people that are in a place that aren't moving to jobs and jobs or to increase their career development. So. Finding those people in the BLM who are dedicated to a place and aren't job hopping is huge. And I know this from experience. You know, you get hired and you work with one botanist, and then the next week they're gone. And you continue doing your work, but no one at the BLM cares that you're doing that because the person who is your connection. So my hope is that through a sampling protocol with a white paper and actual document. With all of this infrastructure behind it that brings it more into the spotlight, perhaps that will go away with time and is part of what you can do. Um, I'm hoping to partner also there in because you'll see the benefit of happening on BLM land in Washington. I want to say it's St. Louis, but maybe it's Andrews, close to anyway. Called well, AIM Assessment Inventory Monitoring, and they have a plot set up where they've been sampling plants in these different regions. For decades now, or a decade, uh, they have a huge data set, and now they want to overlay B data set, which means, in my mind, you can train up the ape as part of their standard protocol when they show up there to throw out the pan traps, leave them while they're sampling, and so it becomes a habit. So the behavior becomes a part of the instead of something that comes and goes. I think I think a lot of this comes down to behavior it really does there has to be an investment beyond just my curiosity and the time yeah so monitoring monitoring doesn't really happen across one season monitoring is definitely just to really get at that yeah uh, Yeah. 
that really the trick. It's a real trick, especially with that floral abundance component. Even my own work, it's definitely there. So what she's talking about is sometimes when you put out a set of pan traps, they get tons and tons of bees, but it's because there's nothing else blooming in the environment, and then you go to the pan traps. But if you put pan traps out in a beautiful field of flowers, nothing goes. So it's almost reversed. You get this reverse sort of relationship where it may look like an area that's completely desolate is habitat, and something with lots of flowers isn't. And it's a real trick for sure. So I think that's where that metadata comes in, and it's really important to collect that so you can weed it at least based on the abundance that are there. I don't want to completely hand traps because I think we have to just acknowledge and accept some of the drawbacks. I don't think the drawbacks are so much that we should uh, ditch this way of allow people without 20 years of experience to participate and that actually has some interesting um, but it, and then it, like you end up with tons and tons of amazing balls and sweat bees show up in abundance in these things. So many. But then at the same time, you get in line, I get very few awesome up in these. And so, so that's really why I do why I do combine those be both. Um, so tied to that, I think this is really interesting, and you've thought about this too. There's a paper that came out not too long ago. They were based on what they were seeing and all of their records in that that they had sold. You guys wanted to see all these amazing things. Oh my gosh, right there, this one. Uh, I'm wondering if the confidence are getting more common and the rare ones are getting more common. If we started using contrasting, we're going to start getting more common bees because we're using this new technique that might give us the sense that those bees are becoming more common. But really, what changed is how we were. And so the, uh, Kind of when a lot of people start to think how long can that they can do this really quickly figure out what's in the area. Things like Nisi, these awesome yellow like express don't go to that and are often also rarer in the environments because they have become rarer, just relevant in terms of the I have both that as well. I don't think I'm ready to get into I think they offer enough that should keep. And I say that not like measure how many offspring are made depending on this, but because for all abundance, you find that as flowers are added, so if that's a floral resources are limiting, if they're limiting competition, right? So you kind of uh, get it that way. Um, are those being rare Does this occur in other areas where there's a lot of really rare things and a few really common? Does anyone still think it's really No proudly people. So my thing is sort of yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, that's really true. There's usually a couple things that are like a lot of them, then one of this thing and one of these. And those are the ones that are always hard to identify too. <laughs>
plan that's not going to be moving back yet. And that if I design something that's useful enough, it could be used by other agencies after we pick it up. And then we can start comparing the Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife and what and wildlife refuges. I think it'd be really cool if we could standardize. Um, and my work on the Tonto, I'm using that for future calls. And so my hope is that that's a, a I definitely see this the interest of different agencies, and I think that has to do a lot with um, priorities. When you're working for the Forest Service, the priorities are wood production and not burning it all down. You have to reduce the amount of wood and you have fire. So timber and fire are the two big costs. Neither of them has any Uh, I didn't put on my we should. Uh, there's a collaborative agreement happening right now on giant areas in northern New Mexico, southern Colorado, a touch of Utah. It's a CFLMP agreement. Collaborative effort across and Pueblo lands, Forest Service, BLM lands. Work together for thinning or burning for all of the trees. That happen there, and with the money, you have to promise that you'll monitor things, and so they decided to monitor things. So suddenly, you just have the opportunity to monitor on Forest Service lands, which they've never had an interest before, because if they promise to monitor those bees, they also get to do these things, and they get to do things with the tree. So hopefully, in the future, there will be more there, but right now, uh, Park Service is really important, and they mostly care about in the Park Service is really looking at They just want those and the BLM. Fish and wildlife is going to be in the future, I believe. I teach middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade girls, all girls. Yes. I get to what they learn as science goes. <laughs> no, it's really great. It works out well because I do that in the winter. The summer work is the bees. The only time it's difficult is like the tail, it, like kids are graduating and I'm like, I need to go to uh, And then in the spring, when they're coming in and I need to be still in the field. So good field is oh, sort of. I keep saying I'm making something and I just. <laughs> it's really hard. I have good students. I'll probably have some. Is that? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, my experience has been this summer. I think it's only that in the winter. <laughs> a little bit of both. Um, I am of the opinion, and I even found a, a paper that validated us. I got it. Was it me? I think that water and grazing okay with a little bit of distance. I get touch of at least in most. Um, so they tend to do okay with that. Um, the overgrazing where they have eaten absolutely thing. My band trap data shows those are areas where. If I go try and find bees there, I cannot find bees there. So I think there are environments where very good to be. And I think bees, the, the plants that the cows preferentially eat, I think because they taste good, are the same ones that bees would prefer to visit. I, maybe the nectar's there, I don't know, but I always find that the plants left behind after cattle have gone through things like oxytropus, the bees really don't want to go to that, but they want to go to the things the cattle eat. Definitely how much of a 